imagine YouTube's not gonna let me get away with playing tubular bells. Oh, uh, let's see what happens if I play it in the background on my iPad. Maybe I can circumvent copyright detection. Oh shit. <laughs> Still gives me the chills, I'm sitting here alone. Okay, but anyway, I'm gonna shut that shit show down. Uh, okay, a couple of quick corrections regarding yesterday's special Halloween episode in which I review the season 7 premiere of The Walking Dead. I believe I called Steven, uh, is it Yun or Yun? Uh, Y-E-U-N. Uh, I believe I called him Steven Young with a G at the end. And when discussing all the messed up stuff that's happened throughout the course of the show, The Walking Dead, not The Week in Doubt, although a lot of messed up stuff has happened on this show too. I was talking about that cherry time that a portly bearded fellow threatened to rape Carl. Um, once again, not on The Week in Doubt. And I said, uh, Rick rips the guy's throat out with his teeth. But it was actually the leader of the group that Rick sinks his teeth into. It's important to make these distinctions. Anyway, let's talk about The Exorcist. So even though I'm an atheist, agnostic atheist technically, and yes, that's a thing, I was haunted by The Exorcist for years, up until my late 20s probably, as sad as that is. I'd have at least one or two nightmares a year about that movie. It came out in the early 70s, 1973 specifically, I believe. I'm not sure how old I was when I first saw it. It was on television and I was uh, just a youngin, maybe elementary school age. It was kind of this weird tableau. My whole family, or most of us at least, were sitting around watching The Exorcist together. Hey, family time's important. Now, my father's always been kind of a gruff guy, a kind of old-school, hard-working, blue-collar type, and uh, all that. But once in a while, he would take this kind of mischievous or borderline sadistic joy in seeing how people would uh, react to, uh, like, unpleasant things. And uh, me watching The Exorcist was one of those times. The movie starts slow, but then eventually all hell breaks loose, no pun intended, and whenever one of the really scary possession scenes would kick in, my father would look down at me with this big mischievous shit-eating grin, and, uh, or at least that's the way I remember it. But somewhere around 27 or 28 maybe, I just stopped being bothered by it, uh, despite how I may have reacted to tubular bells at the uh, beginning. I'm not entirely recovered. Uh, I pretty much stopped being bothered by the idea of things that go bump in the night in general. I can remember, although already a skeptic, there'd still be that superstitious part of me that when I get up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night or descend into a dark basement, it was almost like I half expected something to be waiting for me in the dark. Now I couldn't care less. Either something's there or it's not. Whatever. To me now, the scariest thing is having to pay bills. I think to a certain degree that fear of the unknown or of things that go bump in the night is natural and probably even healthy. It's probably something we evolved to help us stay vigilant against predators and actual worldly threats, but somehow it also got tangled up with fear of the supernatural, too. But for a long time, I definitely had a love-hate relationship with The Exorcist. On the one hand, I resented how much it kind of traumatized or scarred me. And on the other hand, I respected it and still do as an extremely well-made piece of cinema. I've often drawn a weird analogy between The Exorcist and Star Wars. Both movies that came out of the 70s and both movies, in my opinion, that were way ahead of their time for their respective genres. And I don't know if a certain factor, you know, and why I was scared so badly by The Exorcist as a child has to do with my Catholic upbringing. I was raised being told by both my family and by Sunday school teachers that things like Ouija boards and tarot cards were a, a real threat and you always had to be on the lookout for demonic influence, etc. So to some degree, I might have been primed to find the subject matter especially disturbing, but that being said, to me, I think what really makes The Exorcist so impactful are the really disturbing, uncanny, and unsettling visual and audio effects. If The Exorcist had been handed to the wrong director or Friedkin hadn't cared as much as he did, I think The Exorcist 
could have been just another half-forgotten, schlocky horror flick in the annals of movie history. And if you've ever seen any of the behind-the-scenes pictures or reels of some of the prototypes for the Linda Blair effects, it's almost laughable. Some of the initial attempts look more in keeping with cheap horror films of the day. I think a lot of refining went on before they actually achieve that iconic look of the possessed Linda Blair that has sent so many of us to pee pee pants city. No, the exorcist has never actually made me pee my pants. I just love saying pee pee pants city, but you get my point. And I think a lot of, of work also went into the animatronics utilized in those shocking scenes where Linda Blair or Reagan, not Ronald's uh, head spins around in retrospect, the classic head spinning and pea soup scenes might seem a little dated, but I still think uh, they were way ahead of their time and still probably a lot more jarring than a lot of cheap looking CGI work that's out there now. And as I mentioned, I think another big factor was the audio work. The sound effects were really tense and unsettling. And of course, there was the amazing work of Mercedes McCambridge, an old school actress who provided the voice of the possessed Reagan. I think her voice work was so important to that role that I, I don't think the movie would have been nearly as effective without it. I think the writing and directing were also hugely important. The movie was based on a novel of the same name by author and screenwriter William Peter Blatty. And I think Blatty's kind of worldly and intelligent writing style married with Friedkin's kind of realistic, no-nonsense directing style really lent gravitas and believability to a concept that, as I said earlier, could have ended up being just another schlocky 1970s horror film. So you can probably tell by the way I'm talking about it that I have a certain admiration for the film, despite the negative effect it had on me. And strangely, I found myself kind of protective of its legacy and resentful of all the shit sequels that have been made. In 1977, a sequel called The Exorcist II, The Heretic, came out. And it was roundly trashed. I think at least one critic referred to it as the worst film ever made. Neither Friedkin nor Blatty were involved with the sequel. And I recall thinking that other than a couple of decent visual effects, I thought it was pretty much garbage. That not even an all-star cast, including Richard Burton, could save it. And if I may put my male pig hat on for a moment, I think one saving grace was that Linda Blair reprised her role as Reagan McNeil, and she had grown significantly, uh, shall we say, since the previous film, and had sprouted into quite the comely lass. Uh, I don't want to sound too pervy, because I think she may have only been around 17 at the time, but I was even younger when I watched it, so she was probably like a cougar in comparison. I, re <laughs> I remember sneaking downstairs when I was a little older to watch uh, late night softcore movies, uh, TMI, I know. And sometimes I would see Linda Blair starring in these women in prison movies and finding her on the one hand really attractive, but on the other still afraid she was going to suddenly turn possessed and get me. But anyway, I'll move on before this bit gets any more awkward. In 1990, The Exorcist 3 came out, and that film was written and directed by William Peter Blatty, and it was based on his novel Legion, which I absolutely loved. A short book really worth reading, I think. It's a direct sequel to the original Exorcist. The plot is kind of convoluted, but it's still really good in my opinion. Father Damien Karras, the young priest from the first film who presumably dies at the end, ends up getting possessed by the spirit of a serial killer as well as the demon from the first film. Supposedly because he was so close to death at the time, Karras is basically catatonic but becomes active when the possessing entities are working through him. It may sound outlandish, but Blatty really pulls it off and I think it's a great film and the effects are really similar to the first film. I was always confused as to what entity exactly it was supposed to be that possessed Reagan in the first film. I think most just assumed that it was the devil, and even the entity says as much when speaking through the possessed girl. But the film seems to imply that it's the ancient Mesopotamian demon slash deity Pazuzu. 
imagery of Pazuzu is a reoccurring theme throughout the first movie. Father Merrin, while doing archaeological work, discovers what looks like a little stone Pazuzu head at the beginning of the film. Soon after, we see an entire statue in a windstorm or something like that. And then later on, during one of the really intense possession scenes, uh, we see an image of the statue appear in Regan's room while she's kind of rearing up on the bed. The Exorcist 2 plays up the Pazuzu angle, but maybe by being so specific, they, they kind of strip away some of the mystery. And that might be at least one small part of why the film comes off as being kind of corny or cheesy. Around 2004, we had a real mess on our hands. Uh, Morgan Creek Productions, who owned the rights to The Exorcist, had been working on a prequel. The whole thing was a cluster you-know-what. The project was such a disaster, and they were so uncertain about the way things were going, that they decided to make two films. Two different versions of the same film with different directors, but both starring uh, Stellan Skarsgård, is it, as uh, Father Lancaster Merrin. One called The Exorcist The Beginning was directed by Rennie Harlan, and that was released in 2004. And then in 2005, they released the other version, which was entitled Dominion, prequel to The Exorcist, directed by Paul Schrader. They both received overwhelmingly negative reviews, although Paul Schrader's was received somewhat more positively and considered to be relatively more sophisticated and tastefully done um, in comparison to Harlan's. It's been so long since I watched them, I remember thinking they were both crap. Contrary to the reviews, however, I may have actually liked, and I'll put liked in quotes, Harlan's version better, at least due to the fact that I thought the effects, especially uh, the demon makeup, uh, were more in keeping with the original film. Schrader's was the one that had this kind of handicap kid that gets possessed and near the end of the film when the possession's full-blown and the demon takes over. He gets the use of his body again, and he's all bald or smooth like a seal. Like Uncle Leo, remember that Seinfeld episode? And, uh, and I thought it was just ridiculous. I remember the kid utters the line, I am perfection, or something like that. And I'm thinking, no, no you're not. So now, finally this year, they did something Morgan Creek has been threatening to do for a long time. They came out with an Exorcist TV series. And thanks to my friend Crocoduck for giving me a heads up, I had no idea it was even scheduled to air until uh, he told me. I actually like some of the casting, especially for the two priests. There's a younger, more fresh-faced priest portrayed by a Latin actor named Alfonso Herrera. And then there's a uh, gruff older priest, this kind of badass veteran exorcist portrayed by actor Ben Daniels. And I do actually like those two characters and the two actors who portray them. But the plot goes uh, something like this. Uh, you've got Gina Davis, who generally I've really liked over the years as the mom. Um, but I have to say, for some reason, I have trouble warming up to her in this role. I don't know what it is. Maybe one thing is that I think the series insinuates that Gina Davis's character and the younger priest maybe have some history and uh, romantic chemistry between them, and that um, unless I'm mistaken, maybe they went to college or something together, but clearly there's at least a couple of decades between Gina Davis and the actor playing the young priest. Not that there's anything wrong at all with an age difference, but if they're trying to imply they're the same age or something, it kind of ruins the suspension of disbelief. But in fairness, maybe there's some explanation. So Gina Davis's character has two daughters and a husband either suffering from dementia or some kind of brain injury. I actually like the idea of the husband having some sort of brain issue or dementia. I think it creates some interesting plot possibilities. Basically, the younger of the daughters gets possessed. I'm not sure what the daughter's ages are. I get the feeling the older daughter is supposed to be late high school or college age, and the one who's possessed is maybe supposed to be in her mid-teens, perhaps. The actress portraying her looks like she could be anywhere from her late teens to maybe even well into her 20s. I have no idea. And I think that takes something away for me too. Once again, I'm an atheist, but according to believers, in fairness, anyone of any age is a potential victim of possession. But still, I think the idea of a teenager being demonically possessed doesn't strike or disturb me the same way the idea of a younger child being possessed does. 
I think my biggest pet peeve with the show, and I think it's just a weird decision and they could have thought of something else, they decided to represent the demon as this aging character actor in a suit with male pattern baldness. The actor has male pattern baldness, not the suit. Probably didn't have to specify that. It just seemed an odd choice. Uh, I don't know what the symbolism or significance is supposed to be. In the credits, he's listed as the salesman. Maybe they were going for that idea that sometimes the devil comes in ordinary or banal guises. I don't know. There's a creepy scene where they show him and the possessed girl kissing on a train, which is kind of creepy, as I said, since it looks like uh, there's a good 40 years between them. I think part of it is just that, juxtaposed with the shocking effects in the original Exorcist, a bald salesman just seems a little bland. I think the demon initially comes to Reagan as her imaginary friend Captain Howdy in the original, but you never see him, which is maybe the way they should have went. The salesman character does seem to become more grotesque and degenerate looking as the series progresses, which uh, at least I thought was kind of a nice touch. Another thing that disappointed me is just the special effects in general. The original Exorcist has such great effects, especially the look of the possessed girl's face, and that was in the early 70s. Here we are in 2016, and they went for generic sounding demon voices just sounds like someone used a cheap filter or effect or slowed the voice down to sound lower and for the visuals they went with the old tired black eyes thing seems every ghost or possession movie from here to Timbuktu over the last decade or so just makes characters eyes black spooky not to sound like a broken record but the exorcist was way back in the 70s and they had those super creepy oh shit contact lenses that gave Linda Blair that really unsettling look there was an interesting development at the end of the last episode though I had been assuming that the series had next to nothing to do with the original storyline, but bam, at the end of the last episode, Gina Davis's character reveals to the younger priest that she changed her name because of some stuff she went through in the past, and her real name is Ragan McNeil. That's a hell of a plot twist. I was a little torn. On the one hand, when Gina Davis says I'm Ragan McNeil, I was thinking... No, you're not. As cool as the twist was, there may have been a hint of cheese or something that disrupted my suspension of disbelief. But on the other hand, as a fan of the original movie, I, I thought that was pretty damn cool and exciting. And I want to see where they go with it. Does that mean uh, the salesman is Pazuzu? I thought Pazuzu was a giant demon with four wings, a lion face, and rotting genitalia. A bald guy in a suit? Bit of a letdown. But I think uh, I'll call it wraps there. This is the last of the Halloween specials, other than if I do some last-minute replays of uh, old Halloween specials. And then um, I promise next week we'll get back to the regular format. I might touch, uh, touch on some spooky subjects next week, too. Um, I have something planned, but I'll try to work in a, a couple of uh, regular news stories, too. Okay. Later. Wait, should I do it? Should I play us out? Uh-oh, uh-oh. No, man, come on. That ain't right. I have to go to bed in a couple of hours. <laughs>